Hello, everybody, and you're very welcome to the Cult of Cantona, uh, Ireland's Manchester United resource podcast uh, and YouTube channel. We're really excited today. We're joined by uh, somebody who it's I think it's fair to say is uh, infected with the Manchester United disease uh, by birth. Um, and a very well-respected coach um, and a consultant in, um, working in the UK for a number of clubs, but obviously working for Manchester United over a 20-year period on and off. Um, Mr. Paul McGuinness, thanks a million for joining us this morning. How are you? Yeah, great. Good to see everybody. A good soft football. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to have you. Um, from our own perspective as well, to have somebody, you know, with a encyclopedic knowledge of United and I, I suppose I'll start just from an early experiences perspective um, what was your earliest memory of what is what you know now to be Man United I suppose just going in with your dad you know every now and again you, you're going out at that point I'm only four or five so it's everything seems huge obviously that ground as you go as you go down what's now the Munich tunnel you'd go you'd go down on the outside of the ground then Go to the to the, the main intra- entrance, which is still the main director's entrance, and um, you, you'd go through there. I remember clearly that on the doors they had the stickman image. I don't know if you've ever seen that sort of emblem where there's a stickman, it's and it's made into MUFC by all the arms and legs. The way they draw it, it's really clever. So as a kid, you know, you remember that was probably about the height I was going in on the door glass doors there, and then as soon as you went through those doors. Um, yeah, there's the same stairs that, that sort of go up. They go up towards the directors' rooms and everything. But to the left was the dressing rooms, and it was all a little bit like uh, it was all white, white corridor, white brick corridor. You go down there, and um, you had the first team room. I think was at the far end. You had the reserve, the, the the away room. But the the the, the most distinctive thing about it was the smell. <laughs> it was like um, it was like a like your liniment smell, but not the one you normally get. It's a bit different. And um, talking to John Cook, who worked with me for years, he said they used to, yeah, it was called Seven Oils. They had a special oil, this liniment they used to use on the players to give them a rub and in in the treatment room. And that lingered. And I know that was the case because years later, Warren Joyce uh, worked with me uh, in, in the youth development, but his dad, Walter, had played for Burnley a long time. And he worked with us for quite a bit as well in the youth recruitment and he said that it was the most distinctive smell uh, of any ground because it, it had that you could even smell it sort of outside because the dressing room still the, the windows to the dressing room led to outside you know and you could hear all the fans afterwards so that that was yeah was something really stuck with me as a young kid it was really then if you went really distinctly if you went up the stairs and then i remember it, it was I don't know whether it was Samat's office or my dad's because they were in that sort of point at the time where Samat was a general manager and my dad was the coach or whatever. But I remember quite often when you go to to go to the ground with your dad, he's got he gets pulled off somewhere having to do something and you're left in an office. So we were left in Samat's office on on, on like, you know, these uh, revolving <laughs> chairs sort of yeah. spinning around on them. And they were a big novelty as well. You know, you're four or five, you never spin on a spinning chair. So all those little things, the huge bath. So we went in there with the players and I remember them sort of picking you up when you're only young and pretending to throw you in with the players, that type of thing. So, yeah, the the, the first childhood memories of it would, would be all that. And then of my dad playing in the back garden or in the garden and, and, and he, bent, he bent a ball. He, he, we were playing, kicking the ball back and forth, and I was four or five, and then he made it bend. And I remember saying, well, how, how did you do that? How, how did how did you do that? And he said, well, if you come more from the side with your approach and you hit the ball not in the middle but on the side and you bend your foot around it, it's going to curl. And, and it did. So that was me sort of <laughs> captivated with football. And that's me, been me ever since, you know. Yeah, so your dad, so your, dad, your, dad doing that? so your dad bent it like Beckham before Beckham bent it like Beckham. Yeah, that, that's it. Yeah, he, he was quite good at all that stuff to be fair to me, yeah. Did you realise the enormity of where you were? Because I know at four or five you might have been, you know, everyone's. No, but you probably don't. You probably don't at that at that stage. And it, you know, it, it, when you at other clubs, it's sort of like that's your norm. You know, you might go to work and your dad's a carpenter and you help him on the, uh, you know, on the site building site. Well, I went to work with my dad. He was a football coach, so 
you were on the side there or you were joining in, you know. So it, it was the norm, but you did you did know it was special, you know. It wasn't the run of the mill. Yeah. I'll just ask you about your dad's influence in terms of your work ethic and your idea in in terms of dedic your ideas in terms of philosophy and dedication. Um, what did he impart on you about you know the importance of hard work and excellence, excellence in the endeavor? You know. Yeah, yeah. What? I I would say it was more like that. I can't ever say I've considered it hard work. You know, I'm still doing things now. In the summer, we're away with Mick Phelan and the group there, and all through the summer, I think I've taught 250 kids overhead kicks. You can't call that work, can you? And you can't, you can't, you can't really call that work. I'm still doing the same thing as I was doing in the playground. So it's, it's like a lifelong love affair, really. So I wouldn't call it that. Um, it, it, it does anybody who I think goes quite high up in football? It's an obsession with you. You know, you 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 want to do that. But there were, yeah, from my dad, sort of strict standards. Not in the sense of really telling you off in that sense, but in, 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 in setting the standards. So if we were pinging a ball in the in the park and I missed two or three times, I didn't get it right to him, he'd make me run past him to go. So I'd have to run the 30, 40 yards past it to him and then past him to go and get the ball back and say, well, you've got to be more accurate than that. Things like that. The, the standards were, were what he set, both in terms of behaviour and... Uh, and actually playing the ball, get the right touch on the ball, get the right weight on the ball. All those things had to be, you know, a, a, a really high standard. And of course, what was, the, what was the thing for me is all his mates were, were the same, you know. So I, this is this is amazing what happened to me. I put Graham Carrick, who's Michael Carrick's brother, worked with me at the, at the, at the FA. And he said, like, well, you've had football privilege you know, you, you've been privileged all your life, and I, and I have. Like when mm. I was 15, 16, I played in charity games, uh, Man City, uh, Man United versus Man City, or Man United and Man City combined against Piccadilly Radio or somebody else or whoever. So I played mm. with Bobby Charlton, Paddy Crerand, David Sadler, George Best one time, Nobby Styles. And now, if you, in, and those games, are, of course, they're in their 40s, and I'm 15, 16, and they are slower, you know, the games are slower, but you soon find out that it's quite often harder to play slower because the mistake looks so much worse if you don't get that pass to them. So if, if you didn't give that ball to Bobby Charlton, I mean, you talk about Roy Keane being you know, this, this competitor and we think as if it's got to be all aggression and he's demanding and so on. Bobby Charlton was just the same. Mm -hmm. Bobby Charlton was moaning constantly. On the uh, on the pitch, if you didn't give him the ball quick, if it wasn't the right weight, if someone tried the wrong pass, or if someone tried something flippant, you know, not you didn't do the right thing, he had to have it just the right thing, and you had to give him the ball. You know, if you didn't give him the ball quick, and I knew him since I was a kid, he, he'd give me a, like a bit of a bollocking, you know. <laughs> so um, the standards you you got from all of that, the people around it, and I think that's. I think uh, I did years later a talk at the FA and John McDermott, who's the head of the FA, said, yeah, that's that you just come up with something there. That's what you just said. Your standards are your stamp. And they, they do. They reflect in your team the standards on and off the field, you know, that you that you have. And that was sort of ingrained in me from my dad and from all the other people I knew around football. Yeah. <clears throat> I have a question here, Paul. So it's regards to the De Silva twins. So I know they were fairly popular figures at Man United. I see Michael Carrick do an interview when he was talking about them. <coughs> but there's been a long-standing rumour, and I don't know if you can actually answer it because if it, it would cause problems. But there was supposedly a situation where Raphael got suspended. And then the following week, Fabio played at right back. And the rumour was that that was Raphael wearing Fabio's jersey. Any truth to that at all, or can you answer it? Well, in in lots of ways, it could be because they were they were identical in terms of their attitude and their endeavour and so on. But if you did know them, then then you you really could tell them apart. You know, um, Fabio is probably a little bit smoother, smoother on the ball, and um, he's more like the Phil Neville of the duo, and um, Raphael was more like the Gary Neville, the full up and atom fight. Um, but they they were both fantastic. Persons, people, 
first. First of all, they were fantastic people. They came over when they were about 16, 17. So they were joining with my, my group, you know, to start off with. And they were so, they, they, they were such a joy. They, they, they like their enthusiasm and their, uh, um, and their competitiveness and, and just their, their fun smiling while they were doing it all, you know, chasing, tackling, so on and smiling constantly. Um, they, they just lifted the whole thing. So there was a bit where we had a session where we, our boys were doing weights. And I said, well, don't you, you can't do the weights now because you've not been in the same routine as them. You take a bag of balls out on the field uh, on your own and practice, you know, do something yourself. So I was super helping to supervise the weights stuff. And I thought, well, I can't just leave them there. So I went out and, and I'm going out thinking, well, what are they going to be doing? So I watched the practice. They were both ones in goal, one shooting. And if they missed, and, and, and that once the balls had finished, they both sprinted to get the balls. You know, they didn't have a walk or a jog. They sprinted to get the balls, brought them back. And they were doing it on their own. That was such a high standard. But I thought, well, I'll have to do something for them. You know, I'm the coach. So I did all the stuff my dad used to do with me. So I was doing volleys, overhead kicks, uh, finishing, all sorts of things, diving headers. So I was doing that. And they were brilliant. Bang, 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 scoring the goals. And then I think it was Fabio. He was on his left foot. And he skied one over the bar. And I thought, here's a chance. I, you know, they, they've been perfect so far. Here's a chance for me to coach. So I'll coach him. I threw him. I said, throw me a ball. I'll demo. I said, I dip my shoulder down. I fall back over to the side to get my thigh up high. And bang, I hit the ball. And I hit two or three of them. I said, right, I'm going to give you six now. And he went bang, 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 bang. Exactly perfect. He could already do it, you know. And and that's what they were like. I mean, I had a great relationship with him. I, I, Brian McClare sent me to to Brazil. It was a great trip uh, to do some coaching. I felt a bit of a fraud, you know, going to coach some Brazilians. But um, <laughs> I visited them at their home. So I arrived at their home with John Paul, uh, John Calvert Tulum, and um, uh, he was the like, their agent. And working with them and, and our, our scout he was our scout and um they said his monster the monster don't know they're, they're down this is during pre, um like their break their break you know mid-summer break so i go down there and they're playing head tennis on this volleyball court sand so now i join in with their older brother those two are playing against me and we're like there for like two hours playing head tennis and I go back up to their house they sit me down, have lunch, and their mother gives me the two of the biggest caipirinhas you've ever seen. She, she could have knocked me out. I don't know what, what, what I don't know exactly what's in a caipirinha, but I was like, so then all the sugar. They, they, tapped me, <laughs> they tapped me on the shoulder and they said, "Come, on, we go now. Five aside now. They're going to go and play five aside in a cage indoors with all their mates. That's what they did every day during their break from football. They played football all day. Wow. You know, they were amazing." Fantastic family. Yeah, I've, I've experienced a bit of Brazilian culture and I've been to Brazil a couple of times myself and it's incredible. Like the generosity of spirit that everybody has is incredible. Yeah. And you just see kids everywhere playing football all the time. It's all they do. It's incredible. Um, I'll just get back to one or two questions that we've prepared for you. Um, and there's a lot to get through. We could keep you here all day and I know you're a very busy man. But um, I just wanted to ask you in terms of coaching in general, because this is something that... Um, a lot of people would want to know. Number one, how has coaching changed um, over the last 20, 30 years in, in your time and where it is now, uh, first of all? And then secondly, uh, a broader question about, particularly in United uh, over the last couple of years, there's been questions over a lot of injuries popping up, you know, and whether or not, um, how do these things manifest? Why have United been so unlucky? In your opinion, from the outside looking in now, um, was it just bad luck or um, have we have we fallen so far behind in terms of uh, that side of things in terms of sports science, recuperation, um, uh, medical attention, etc.? Have we neglected that or is it just bad luck? So you got two questions. The, the, the first one on the on the, in terms of the coaching. Yeah. How coaching do you think might have changed over the last 20, yeah, 30 well, years? Yeah. It's like anything. It's co it changing. It's changed and develops at the senior level, and a lot of that then filters down into uh, junior football as well. Can do, and with the with the advent of the internet, nearly everything can be seen. But the problem with that is, uh, you might see I saw, I saw one today uh, online, and it's they're doing a relay as a warm up before training, and then 
chipping a ball over the goal, over a mini goal and Hennessy, which is all very well. But what people don't realise, that's like a cool down session for a first team who've played the day before and that's all they're doing. It's, it, it's just a cool down. But people then take that five minutes that they're using out of their whole first team week and they give it 10, 15 minutes in their grassroots session. And they've only got an hour a week. So they, they you know, they, they're completely doing the wrong thing, you know? And that can happen a lot of the time. People look at what the first team do and then try and put it in kids' football. In, in terms of that, when I was at the FA, I, I saw that there was a lot of people on the coaching badges, which is high performance, it's team mm -hmm. and so on in terms of A licence, B licence, so on. But while they were either playing in the demonstrations or, 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 or coaching in it, they had only one lens, which is looking through the tactical lens of formations and so on. And they were not looking at the individual tactics and the details of connections between players, and uh, etc. So that's been my big focus for the last few years, uh, first at the FA and then down now in this co uh, consultancy role that I've got, is to try to um, give, give coaches the focus of not just the big game, the three thirds, the in and out possession, the low block, the high press. It's what's inside that. How do the three players work together now to press? How do they, what do you do individually? What's your footwork like? What's your body orientation like? What's your scanning like? Uh, what's your deception like to sneak up on your opponent? All these sort of things. So I, I, I really think that that work. Is, it should be done at the same time in a foundation so that you, you change your lens as a coach, depending on whether you're looking at an individual, a group or the team. Yeah, if I could just interject quickly and just ask you about a rumour that's circulating in the, in the press um, about Eric Hag punishing the players by overworking them. Um, and if there's any truth in that, is that excessive? And is, is you know, obviously, you know, if players... The results don't go well to bring them in earlier for training. We know that players do get punished. They do have to work on certain things. But it, it, surely overrunning players or over-exhausting players in between big matches um, is not, uh, yeah, not proven. I, I, I think that's, again, you know, someone takes one story and they make it into something that's happening all the time. I don't believe for one minute that Eric Ten Hag in between big matches, Liverpool and then a and then a, a European game on a Tuesday and then playing again on it, it would do that. I think there was maybe one instance at the beginning of one, of one season when he's first in where he did it and he was in the running and he was trying to prove a point that, you know, we're all in it together or what have you. I, I, that's my reading of that type of situation. Um, uh, I, I, just, I just couldn't see that that would be the case. Um, and, and again, with all of these okay. things, um, it... it it has to be in context to your team, uh, your, uh, uh, you know, the situation and so on. And that's why, again, you, you, I call it premature professionalism. You can have a lot of the, the stuff that you want with a multidisciplinary team and a lot of ideas on that, which in theory can be right. But if you, if you don't get the right balance for kids, then, then you can, um, you can, you can certainly damage them that way as well. Uh, and, and that's hard to get that balance unless you've, have some experience as well you know um so there's the kids who who don't play enough games but train too much or there might be too, some kids who who don't who don't tra who, who don't train enough and just play games you know so you, you've got to know the balance of it like i i hear now periodization of a week for kids now periodization of a week for of course, you, you don't want to absolutely, you know, absolutely kill them. But the idea is that you're, you know, periodization, you're peaking for a big match, you know, a, a huge game at the weekend. And then you're taking it down. So now with kids, you, you're trying to maximize the amount of training they can do without getting injured and so on, but to maximize the volume. So it doesn't matter so much if you're not absolute peak condition for the game at the weekend, because the game at the weekend is only a part of the, the whole training week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just about in terms of the evolution of, of coaching and sports science and, and, and um, medical attention, uh, have I, I know it's very hard to speculate from the outside looking in, but uh, have we 
inflicted our own a culture of of affecting in terms of the injuries and stuff in a negative capacity or have we just been over the last couple of seasons just terribly terribly unlucky you know i don't know you, you, i really wouldn't you don't know unless you're in there you know the facts you, you, <laughs> you know all those things um but you, you do know that they've had a number of players they signed some players who were injured when they signed so that's you know you've yeah. got to know that i think they did know that and then it's how do you nurse them through it and and, and so on so you know they, they knew Holland was injured when they when they got him. He couldn't he couldn't train and play full out, and so you've got to bear all those things in mind. Um, and that would be this, you know, the same with other players. Uh, and you've got to remember that the other leagues are not like the English league. They, they you yeah. know, they, they're not like the English league in terms of intensity, number of games, and so on. Uh, and when people change, then there's. Um, yeah, there's there's a knock-on effect to that as well, yeah. We are very heavily linked to Van Nistelrooy uh, as a player. And we went to sign him in 2000 and he did the medical. The medical staff said, the egg's about to go. And then we signed him a year later. We put a delay on it. So the medical well, report the then was enough to tell us, no, we can't take the punt on signing him. Let the injury happen. He healed and then we signed him. But now we will bring in Rasmus Hoyland who came in with some sort of serious back injury, which is a big concern sign a player with a back injury of anything but it's a it's a sign of the times that we're are now willing to sign injured players and bring them back to health i'm, I'm not sure if it's the greatest philosophy hopefully it does work out with rasmus i'm a big fan but um he, he hasn't been very healthy since we've signed him which is a bit of a concern yeah it's always a difficulty you know some uh, manager wants to sign a player i remember van gaal signed falcao and yeah. it looked like he was running on one leg, you know. So, uh, <laughs> no, it, it, seriously, I think he was. I think he was limping. I think he, he he had been a great player, great finisher, but then he he wasn't, you know, he wasn't fully fit. And I think our swap was Falcao in and Danny Welbeck out. And now yeah. Danny yeah. Welbeck a few few injuries to be fair, isn't he? So, but with the even with the injuries he's had, he'd still be our best centre forward if he was playing now. Paul, even this season, he's well, he scored well, six or seven goals. He scored more than any Man United striker this season. So, proofs in the pudding there. It must be the coaching. Um, so, answer me this, uh, just in terms of academy graduates. Um, I mean, you've see, seen some great players come through, obviously, Marcus and, uh, and Danny, just to name two off the top of your head. But who are the most memorable for you? And I don't mean in terms of what they've achieved as professional footballers afterwards and what they've done, but in terms of characters around the place, um, in terms of innate ability, um, was all different reasons. I mean, Danny Welbeck. I, when when they asked me who's the who's the best, I said, well, my favourite player is Danny Welbeck, and that was basically one of the big things about that. Is well, I was the under nine to under sixteen. I was in charge of all the schoolboy stuff, and he was in from eight all the way up. And uh, I, because we didn't have as many staff, then I was in taking every age group, or we'd go on tours or trips or training camps, uh, and so mm -hmm. on. And then when he got to 16, I then moved up to the under 18s and I brought brought him in as a 16 year old to play in the under 18s because he was yeah, you know, he was ahead. He was he was a real talent. And of course he played in the played in the first time, I think, when he was 18, something like that. Um so and, and as a lad, as a as a person, as a, a as a leader, but as a a player, I thought he was a, he was an outstanding player, probably just not quite clinical enough to you know to be that top top sort of uh finisher but an all-round top player and a great lad so he 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 really stands out as as as, as a terrific lad but we've got other people who you, you know people never even hear of who've gone on and had decent careers at other places who were also like absolute diamonds of lads behind the scenes um, i had a question on, on a player that yeah. was in the academy that never really seemed to make it i got mutv in 2002 and they didn't broadcast the senior team games live, but they did do the reserve games. And there was a player called Daniel Nardello. And every time he was watching, yellow. banging goals in for fun, he looked absolutely lethal. And I never heard of him then, thereafter, the academy. He never seemed to make it to the yeah. Premier League. I know Sylvan Evanks Blake went on to Wolves, and Fraser Campbell did play a couple of games for United and moved to Spurs and Sunderland, but never heard of Daniel again. Yeah, I don't know if he ended up in America. Um... I'm not sure. I mean, we we're now getting to a stage where 
there's a lot of players we've coached. I was talking to Tony Whelan about this, who's at the academy for years, and there's there must be there's sixty or seventy at least who are now coaching at at different levels. Some are managing. You've got David Gray's in Scotland managing Hibs. You've got um, David Healy. He's over in Northern Ireland. Been been one of their top managers for years. You've got uh, you've got Tom Cleverley. He's in. Um, he, he's in uh, Watford. He's at Watford, and they got lots of others at different levels and stages. So, yeah, I'm proud of that as well because what that does is it filters it filters out a lot of hopefully uh, good football to the to the rest of the you know the football community. Yeah, yeah. I think what it does as well is that you know if you're coached correctly and if you know if you're mentored correctly, uh, United for some reason seems to have a ratio of uh, like you said there about uh, in terms of coaches going forward so the philosophy you often hear it on the man united podcast and you hear it uh, from ex-players in interviews about how even if they didn't make it you know all the way in terms of being a player they you know being in that environment and being uh motivated and encouraged and and, and nurtured correctly not only teaches them you, you hear it from the class of 92 as well about how they've it, it, it kept them uh you know life lessons to take forward and to bring into other facets whether it be business or coaching or whatever else so there's a that's kind of school of excellence ideology uh is is, is omnipresent in terms of coaches and stuff and going forward uh in in their careers and also in their lives to succeed it's not not everybody's going to have a success story but you can see that it's wide spreading in terms of the ideology of manchester united and what it means that kind of believe ideology which a lot of fans it inspires a lot of fans also as well but in terms of coaching um like what advice would you have particularly to, to coaches um in terms of long terms long-term career uh, long-term careers and what what advice would you give either a to yourself as a young coach or to a young coach um taking on that role and how to get the best out of young people and inspire them and engage them especially in a time where they're so easily distracted and uh, and, and short attention spans and all of these other distractions and uh, what advice would you give to young coaches well the first thing is to get in a room with the top people with the best people you can do because that's part of the problem we've got well, a problem but part of the situation you've got now you've got a whole di interdisciplinary team Who's been in? You put um, sort of. You have to have them in your academies, different age groups. And um, when I started coaching at Man United, I was in the, going in the coaches' room with Eric Harrison, Jim Ryan, Brian Kidd, Nobby Styles, Sir Alex would be in, would be in. So you five, six, Pop Robson, five, six absolute top people. So now they all go in an office with a load of other people who've not really got a lot of experience. So when you get the chance to get in the room, that take it, grab it. I mean, I, I do a lot of things for the FA, do talks and so on, and, and it's amazing how few people come up to you afterwards and ask you questions and stuff. Um, and I always love it when they do. And uh, I get more now get online, come and ask questions and so on. But get in that room and ask questions because you want to pass it on is a big thing. So I, like I said, I had that privileged life. I would be getting in the room with my dad going to the training ground. I'd be sat in the, the, the meetings with the manager and all that. I, I was almost like, I'd just sit there and keep quiet. And they almost forgot I was there. And I'm listening to everything about all the talks about every player and all this sort of stuff. So I, I grew up immersed in all that. I used to go to uh, games with him and scout with my dad, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So I'm in the boardroom with, and, and then at half time before the game, you you he's listening and I'm looking up, talking to some, you know, some of these top guys. And I remember this one. I always tell this story like I was about 14 and I was mad about football. I wanted to be a player. And um, uh, we played, it was Stockport County on a Friday night, half time. And they're talking away, five or six. And then this guy saw me and, and, and he turned around. And I didn't know it at the time, but this guy was a guy called Peter Doty. And he was like the De Bruyne of the 1940s, 50s, <laughs> right? He played for Northern Ireland. He played in the world. He was the manager of the Northern Ireland World Cup squad. So he was an absolute legend. But I didn't know that at the time. And he turned and he said to me, "He said to me, do you want to be a player, son? Do you want to be a player?" And I said, "Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah, absolutely, yeah." He said, "I'll give you one bit of advice. 
And this is what he said. He said, never kick a ball aimlessly. I've never, ever forgotten it. Because now, you know, whatever it is, you see kids come on a pitch, just kick the ball towards the goal. Just kick it at someone. They don't say, I'm going to hit it really with the right weight, with spin, just in front of his foot. So he's playing there, play it exactly the right weight, and, you know, the right timing, all of that, you know. So that, that mm-hmm. sort of detail, I would say, you get that standard by being in the room with the right person. And then this, the second thing is, 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 is in a sense for those coaches is be yourself. You know, you, you don't copy someone else or so do what you love doing. So I coach what I really like. So I coach combination play. I coach the run for the pass for the ball over the top. I coach the things I like. Um, and in the way I like um, dragging and dodging for, for wide men and play, you know, to shoot are the things I've grown up. I love it. I, you, you've got to coach because if you don't coach what you like, you coach someone else's model, game model or whatever, then you, you won't be able to convince the players as well. The job's really about convincing the players. And if you're not really convinced, you can't get that over as well. So don't just copy someone else. And then the, the third thing really is, is, is very simple and, and, and it's pretty obvious, but, but a lot of people don't do it, is your practice has to be a slice of the game and it has to clearly be that to the players. So yeah. three mini goals on the pitch, four or five mannequins, and that's, the players can't see all that as the game. They need to see the game. And, and and this is where Eric Harrison, the class of '92 coach, he was my coach before them. Every training session, every single training session, you had to do the things you needed to do in your position. It was just a simple game or line ball, but with a certain condition and focus. And you didn't, you, you weren't stopped all the time. Let it go for eight or nine, ten minutes. He'd, he'd, he'd then bring you in. He'd make a couple of points there and there, or if you if you need to, he'd shout them on from the side. Just a couple of things. And then on Saturday, you go, Jesus, this is exactly what I saw the other day that Eric was telling us. He was like he was, uh, you know, he had the premonition. He knew exactly what was going to happen. Um, so there would be three three things, you know, in, in a sense, get in the room with the right people, have to get, develop the right standards in, as well, um, be yourself, and then um, and then make it look and feel like the real game. So... Just in terms of behind the scenes staff with some great stories that come out. Albert Morgan, he would tell stories about how during match days, he'd wear a handful of wedding rings or he'd be always wearing Peter Schmeichel's Rolex. Or how he, when he went in for heart surgery, Brian McClare showed up with three coffin samples for him if he would die. So I was wondering, in terms of coaching, and I know Nicky Butt as a player was always a wind-up merchant for the players, but was there anyone in the coaching staff with you guys who was also a wind-up merchant and was into that sort of uh, messing or was it all really serious and business when it came to match prep? No, uh, for me, again, you, the, the absolute balance, you, you've got to have the players not coming in as if they're coming to school. They're not coming to school. It's different. It's football is different from school. We're going to work hard, play hard, but there's got, there's got to be some real fun to it. And there's science behind this in the sense that if you if you do some fun activities where you're going to have a laugh and a joke and so on, there's a woman called Barbara Fredrickson, done these experiments in America with showing groups different horrible scenes or different dull dull things. The whole group of them have to read, look through it, what have you, watch a film that's really not nice, and then go out and do this creative task. Compared to another group who are, who've got something where it's a laugh, a joke, and so on, it's fun. They go out, well, they're the more creative in the practice. So I, I got this as well from my dad, who was England youth coach in the 60s. He was one of the youngest coaches in his 20s because he broke his leg when he was 22. And then he was the England youth coach. They won the World Championships, the European Championships, and they were at a tournament in in um, Gran Canaria. So they were. he took them down the beach. He said, they were all day on the beach. A guy who met the old boys dinner the other week said, yeah, I was there. We were all day on the beach. We couldn't believe it. You know, we're just a group <laughs> of 17 year olds having, a fun, having fun, you know? So he <clears throat> he used to have these Cine 8 films. He took his camera with him. So they see, they see them diving off the dock onto the into the sea and all that. And then there's a massive sand dune. It's 300, 400 foot high. 
and it, it films it. They're filming it for like four or five seconds. You go, what's this? And then all of a sudden, my dad comes running over this hill, and he's running as fast as he can. He's sort of his feet are going down like three nine foot into the, all the sand, and he's coming down. He's nearly falling over. And then all the team come after him, and they've all got towels tied around their heads, and they go, wah, 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 they're chasing him down this <laughs> thing, you know. So, and I, I said, I said, you can't do that. It's England. He said, well, well, we did. And then I used to do the same thing. If we were in the milk cup in Northern Ireland, every Tuesday we went to the beach. So it didn't matter. We were playing Monday night, Sunday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Every Tuesday we went to the beach. We did this daft warm-up along the beach. Then we did army manoeuvres and had to try and capture a flag through the um, sand dunes. And then we did this daft relay where you ha eventually it ended up with them all doing a rugby pass in the water full length you know and they've got this freezing and then they're all up to their neck and they all had to do it you know in fact there's only a couple who never did it and, and, and they all caught them afterwards Ravel Morris won't go in but they all caught him and threw him in as well you know so it was always like having that banter and fun then we would we went to Bisham Abbey went to anywhere in Europe on tournaments training camps I used to take a dressing up bag so low to just gear for dressing up hats gear, dresses, different props. And say there's a squad of 18, they would have to, the, they would have to in the evening, I've got them cleverly, uh, cleverly's on it, and all, Ollie Norwood is on it. There's a load of them all on this doing dressing up. And they would have to do a sketch and then we would vote for them. You know, everybody voted for, for the best sketch. And that was such, the next day I'm sure they were more creative because they were more connected off the pitch. You know, so that that type of thing is is completely for me essential. You know, so when they go in, I watch some place and I think academy. It's like they've they've had a day off school, but they're going back to school again. Yeah. What's the yeah. point in that? You know, it, it should feel the mixture of high class football and like the youth club. They're going to the youth yeah. club, it's like creativity great. club. You sound great. Like a great you know? You sound it's, like a great, a great drama teacher, Paul. You know, in the it, best well, sense of the it, word. Well, that was part of it. We used to have different <laughs> themes like that. We had white, hunting dogs as a theme. We had uh, what, attacking like wild horses. Different things like that. So I think then you're making a fun story out of it, and, and it really works. But the the question of was there someone who was doing that? The guy who did. We had a Christmas pantomime, which was legendary. Uh, was Rod Thornley? Now Rod Thornley. Was was the, only talking the, to Rod the other day about coming up. He was the, he was the masseur, right? But he was also well in with all the lads. He used to go out with them. And he had so we had all the dirt on on the first team and 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 everything. But also he was one of their mates, and he he was no whole bad. He would pick whatever pantomime like Snow White and uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves or whatever it was, and then he would rip into the first team, and everybody was there. The, the the canteen ladies, the people from the office, they're all in there, and he, he he didn't care. He just he he just he made up these sketches with the with the apprentices. They were like sixteen to eighteen year olds, and and um and he, he didn't he, he didn't bother them who he was. And I don't know how he got away with it. I don't know how he got away with this one because Van Gaal came, and um, they were doing different sketches. And <laughs> one of the players comes in dressed as Van Gaal. So he's got, he's got he's got the he's got the blazer on, he's got the he's got the blazer on, the flip chart and all that. But his head, because Van Gaal's got a massive head. Van, he, they had like they had a massive cardboard box on his head, and you're watching it and you're thinking, I can't believe that, that they're doing this. It's so it was unreal. And then you have some of the injured players, they'd have them. And they had all the, the bandages from the medical room. There'd be like four of them come in with crutches and everything. And they bandaged from head to toe all the way up. And then they'd take the bandages off and it would be whoever's shirt underneath, you know, whoever had been injured for that. Uh, there was, I've got, there's so many of them. And I, I really, it, I, it wouldn't be, I couldn't say some of the things because they would probably get locked <laughs> up for saying some of them. But he, he was, it, and, and what, it, what it did, it, 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 it created a connection between all the departments and all the club, um, you know, and on that on that day, on that Christmas dinner, where it was the Christmas dinner as well, all the staff, the coaching staff, handed out all the 
all the food to all the other staff and the players and stuff like that. It, 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 it was oh, it, I, some of the things I can think back. Uh, uh, you, uh, you can, you can see why you wouldn't get away with it now, definitely. No, you, you can see why Rod Thornley's going to do well over in Jamaica now with Steve, can't you? Has he gone over there? Seriously? Yeah, he's working That's with the Jamaican it. national team now. He yeah, could yeah. play up front for them. He's not a bad player. <laughs> um, <laughs> couldn't ha have you know a call like this with you without mentioning Alex Ferguson and his influence on you, his influence on the club. And, um, you know, how has his philosophy and his man management and his um, presence at the club influenced you and the club? And can he ever be replaced? I don't think he can in terms of that level of success. Uh, yeah, no, no, he, he, he was, it was huge. But of course, it, it developed and people forget this. You know, he was struggling at the start. Four, five years, six years before they really got going. The pitch was awful at Old Trafford. He was had some problems getting players in. He had to get some players out. He had some discipline problems. He had, you know. So people forget that, and 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 what they did was stick with him at that point. Um, and that's that is the probably the biggest lesson because anybody who sticks with a manager um, has, has got then the chance that they they're um, they've got continuity, you know. So people seem to think it's easy that you can transport one manager in after another manager's been in and another manager's been in two, three years before that. Well, football's, although it looks simple, is a lot more complex than that because now you've got a whole set of different language. What they say, this is a different guy's game plan. They change five or six players in that time and then another five or six players in that time. And now, so it makes it really, really difficult. So, the, the strength of Sir Alex was that he was able to keep that consistency, um, uh, you know, for, for so long. And, and he was, he was amazing. And the biggest thing was, I suppose that he, he gave young people a chance. I wouldn't be sat here now. I was only 26. What was that? When he brought me, brought me back, I was a player. Then he brought me back on the staff, uh, helping education, welfare first. And then he, I was the youngest ever, must be that's director of a center of excellence. I was only about 27. I hadn't had any experience, nothing. I actually saw him the other week. I went to his house with Jim Ryan and I said, I said, why did you give me that job? You know, and he said, well, I knew you as a player. And then this is a big thing really. He said, but I knew you'd also been to Loughborough and all, and all that. And, and so in a, in a, in a crazy way, me, me going there did help my whole career. It, it gave me an extra, an extra experience for an extra sort of qualification that got me that job through the door, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, someone like that taking an interest in you as a person and encouraging that um, spark in you. Um, obviously, that's something that you, you don't take lightly and that's what you try to pass on to other kids, you know, in terms of the coaching, but also in terms of inspiring people uh, to achieve. Um, and obviously, that's with a sense of humour as well. Like people think Fergie was, you know, a lean, mean, disciplined machine all the time, but he was good crack as well, wasn't he? Yeah, he had the balance of all those things, you know, and the ability to turn from one thing to the next and and, and complete completely sort of. It could be with the first team, it could be something going on, then he could come to the youth, and he could be different. He used to he used to speak to parents before the games. Two o'clock before three o'clock kickoff, I'd take parents into his office, and he, he would talk to the parents and say, "Look, we're going to do this. We can help him. We can get, give him a career. He's got to be dedicated. He's got to do this. We can't go out with his mates, but we will give him the best." And then he'd go, "Oh, hang on, it's two thirty. I've got to give my team a team talk." You know, so but he had the ability to switch uh, from from one situation to the next uh, and keep it all under control was was amazing, and um, yeah, that that ability to sort of inspire you but it he what inspired you a lot was he, he gave you a lot of space to do your work you know he, he delegated let you get on with it like every now and again he'd give you a reminder or you, you got a bit of a you know um you, you know a, a bit of a slap come on you need to fuck up on this or what, or what have you but he, he he gave you a lot of space in that, yeah. that fact he trusted you that much isn't well, that would you would you agree that that's a key component in good management in life in general to 
hire the right people and, and, and let them do their jobs. Yeah. And of course, to set the standard, to set it down. I mean, I remember not long afterwards, there was a really big lesson for me. You know, uh, I, I had the, it was the, one of the first, what they call the holiday courses, it might have been October or something like that. And people are off school. So we got them from all over the country. They come with the scouts. And that was the first time I'd had to organize it. It was a big job during the week because you had to organize all the training, trial games, hotels, everything else, um, get them back and forward on minibuses, kits, the whole thing. And, um, and and because because I was young and some of the scouts were a lot senior to me, I was a bit uh, reticent to speak to them. You know, I, I, what do I do here? And I was getting all the jobs done. So I got all the work done, the jobs done, everything. Thing We got we had to get them uh, in meetings with the manager after the games, everything. And then on the Monday morning, he, he took me in his office and said, look, uh, I've had some complaints from some of the scouts. They say you, you, you're arrogant, you're not spoken to them. And I was like, no, I was just being busy. And and he said, yeah, I know that. He said, but you've got to remember, when they come here, you've got to make them feel special. You know, they're working in the rain. They're working in the snow. They're working late nights. They're going to families and bring them lots of traveling. He said, when you come here, they, they've got to feel a part of it and special. And I was gutted, you know, I was gutted. But it was one of the best lessons because that's what I tried to do with them all forever after that. Whoever came, what it was, I wanted them to feel how great this club was. And that's that was a big lesson. Um, no matter what the situation, you know, make people feel good. It's and a he, he basically was doing that all the time. That, that I think he was doing it every day with the gate men, the kit men, the, the laundry ladies, the girls in the office, whoever it was. He was making them feel a part of it all the time. Um, Paul, I just wanted you saying you grew up around Sir Bobby. As a as a <coughs> United and England fan, when I was growing up, Bobby was a, a big hero of mine. Um, so do, did you know when you're growing up the, the, the gravity of like his sort of um, ability and sort of his sort of, I suppose, what the, the general fan would think of him? Because you were sort of part of, he was part of your life. So were you aware of sort of the aura this man had? Or, because um, I met him, I, I passed him one day at Old Trafford. I nearly fainted when I seen him because, I mean, yeah. it, you, you sort of bump into a hero or whatever. I was wondering, were you, were you aware of um, how big the, the, the man was when you were around him? Well, that, that, that sort of developed because I was, uh, you know, was, um, his daughters, were around my age or a little, uh, Suzanne was a little bit older. So we'd be at each other's birthday parties. So you'd go to their house for birthday parties. They'd come to ours. We'd see them at Christmas, so on. So you you see them. So they were just like anybody else's family friend. But then you, you do get a feeling, oh, no, there's a bit more to it than that. You know, but his his wife, Lady Norm, was like phenomenally good socially. So she had great stories. She would come home. They'd traveled all over the world. And she'd be talking. So you were... She was the main focus when they came. He'd sit in a corner, very quiet like he is, and he'd every now and again he'd say something. And but she was the main storyteller. So I, you, you sort of got used to that. You know, if you knew they were coming, oh yeah, Uncle Bobby, Auntie Norma were coming. It was like, oh right, it's a special thing. You'd sit in the room. You would stay in the room with them. Sometimes some people came. And you were desperate to get out. You no, know, but they were. She was so captivating that you, you wanted to do that. But and of course you you knew you got that feeling. But as you got older. Like my dad used to say to me things like, well, if I hadn't broken my leg, I'd have been in that World Cup. I'd have been one of the stars, all these sort of things. Because he's not sure on confidence, my dad. He's, I was one of the best players, you know. And then you start to see bits on TV. And I used to think, dad, you're not even the best player in our living room when Bobby comes around. You know, you're not close, <laughs> you know. So so he would, he would do that. But then, of course, all that happened. But then I did I did play in these games with him. I must have played, I don't know, a dozen games, maybe 10 well, I don't know, six to a dozen games on all different little small grounds, non-league grounds, different sometimes on school fields. And I'm playing with him right alongside him, you know, passing the ball. And um, and then he drops his shoulder and beats the guy and smacks one in from 30 yards. And then he does the same thing with his left foot. And he's, uh, and then he's hitting one with fade to the other side. And then he's, he's just he's just absolutely majestic. The way he moved, the, the 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 drop of his shoulder, the change of the pace, and then hitting the ball. There's a great interview with Steve Perrin where he says, well, yeah, but Bobby didn't just hit one ball. He hit four balls. He hit the first ball, the second ball, the third, the fourth. That was his follow-through, like right into the – that was the power of it. And I've just put some 
things out on online saying, well, you know, the stats now are saying there's less goals than ever scored by by uh, long grain shots. And I'm like, it just doesn't make any sense. That's a statistic. Now, the only way that's happening is because the, the managers and coaches are not getting them to do it. And in the academies, they're not doing it. They're playing with small goals and they, they're just not practicing enough. They're not practicing. If they practiced like Bobby Charlton and Glenn Hoddle and that, there'd be loads more goals because the ball is lighter. It flies faster. They're, they're not on a muddy pitch. They're not with a heavy leather ball. You know, Bobby Charlton now would score. I don't know, how many goals would he score? But he, people aren't actually yeah. trying to do it. But he was, you know. And then you got I got the stories from a dad. Yeah, you've got to shoot with both feet off the floor like Bobby Chan. You've got to run at it, knock it out of your feet, run at it. So my, my dad used to take me to uh, York Golf um, York Racecourse when when I was at school. My school playing fields were in York Racecourse. The name's my. But there was a massive wall. I mean, I'm talking the biggest wall you've ever seen down the side of the grandstand. It was huge huge and it was a bit undulating the grass but we'd start about 20 yards out he said right run out your feet hit as hard you can like bobby charlton both off the floor do it with your right foot then your left foot and then they'll go back five yards and they go back five yards and they go back five yards and they go back and i was shooting from 45 yards at the age of 14 and that ball was flying the ball was flying honestly so these people who say they don't they're not practicing you know, the, 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 if, and the thing is, all you got to do is watch that. It's so graceful, Bobby Charlton. It, it, it's such a force of nature that you think, wow, why wouldn't you want to do that? That's unbelievable. And with these light balls now, it'd swerve all over the place. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Bobby was just... But underneath all that is an absolute... Like, but to see Steve Perrin says, oh, well, he was a sir even before he was a sir. He was majestic. Yeah. You know the way he played, but also the way he held himself, his manners, his his whole persona, and so yeah, we got we got to know. Yeah, we we were part of that. No, knowing him, you know, they went on holidays together when they were younger. Um, so yeah, so Bobby, very very special player, um, and and person. You know, just and and it should be should be an inspiration particularly for Man United players, you know, it should be. In fact, we used him for an inspiration for a player. There's a player called Ollie, Ollie Rathbone. And he came, when he came at 11, he's the same size as everybody else. And he's a really bright little player. And then everybody else grew but him. So when they're 14, he's still like 11. When they're 15, 16, he's like 12. When he's 17, 18, he's like 14. But he's, he's a great character. His dad, he's gone Baz Rathbone. He, he, he was a player at Blackburn. He's a physio at... Everton, everything, real football family. And Brian McClare was was brilliant because he said, well, we took him all the way to 16 now. There's no way under uh, would he be a pro under uh, anywhere else. He said, but he's such a good lad. We've got to keep with him. So he, he came at the under 18. still didn't play that much. But what we did, Jim Ryan and I, because Jim had seen it done with a Brazilian lad in America as well as I did exactly that that I was talking to you about, so every day after training, get a ball, get some balls from the six yard box, or from 12 yards, out your feet, smack it, both feet, out your feet, run it, both feet off the floor like Bob Jarm. Then we move back to 18, then we go to 24, then we go to 30, then we go to 36, and now you shoot. So he just kept him doing it. And then he, he moved to Rochdale, then he went to Doncaster, and he sent me videos of him of, of both feet off the floor <laughs> scoring in league football from 25 30 yards you know so uh, i know you can do it if you, you, you so just paying attention to it and, and and he's an absolute diamond of a lad yeah he's every club he'd go to i'd imagine they're really you know great personality and i love you know great little footballer yeah so important to have a you know to be likable and to you know have good character um, and you've summed that up really brilliantly about sir bobby um, one thing that always touches me is obviously Sir uh, J Jack Charlton recently passed away in the last couple of years, and there's a lovely touching bit I think at the BBC Sports Personality Awards where he got, at the end where he says, you know, um, Bobby is the best footballer I've ever seen, my brother, mm. you know, and you know as you know they didn't have the most perfect of relationships, but it's wonderful to see that testament of his 
you know, Jack, Big Jack, acknowledging the fact that he was the most wonderful player ever and also had the, you know, the privilege of being his brother. That says it all, you know, for a brother to say that about another brother is really moving, I think. And it's, it's, it's it, it, it goes in some way to describe how good Sir Bobby was. And Sir Bobby was my dad's uh, hero, along with Georgie and, and Dennis. But um, I'll just ask you very quickly um, just about Eric Cantona, because the, the, podcast is called the cult of canton and we're all cult members over here in dublin um have you any funny stories or inspiring stories or unusual interactions <laughs> with eric because everybody yep. has one that we've had on about how yeah uh, how unusual and wonderfully and wonderful he was yeah i remember very clearly uh i'm only young coach oh i'm the same age as eric so so I'm about 27, but for coaching, that was that was young, really, probably in his playing. And they finished training. It was at Littleton Road. So it's like, it's basically just like a public park almost. You know, people could walk across it in those days. Uh, and they did used to walk across with their dog, you know, from around there in Kersal. Um And he, he just saw me there. He didn't know me. I'm just one of the coaches. And he said to me, uh, can you cross some balls for me for, for after training for, for practice? So... Nobody else there at that point, I don't think. It's me and him and um, and the goal. And I'm crossing me and he's heading them. He's volleying them. He's doing overhead kicks. He's doing, you know, side volleys. He's, he's fantastic. And luckily, you know, I was all right. At that point, my my technique would have been would have been Premier League class at that point, you know. And and But the, the absolute great thing about it was after about 15 minutes of doing it for him, he goes, uh, OK, your turn. Right, so I, he's now crossing them for me, and I'm doing overhead kicks, volleys, all this. And, and like, luckily, that's what I used to do on a Sunday with my dad. We'd go on the field and and I could do them, you know. And um, but I just thought it was uh, what I call the spirit of football. He could have just said, Oh, thanks a lot, and, and, and got in his car and gone back back to the cliff. But he was like, It was, it was just like two lads in a field, really. Uh, and and it felt, yeah, it felt fantastic. Um, and another time when he was on his ban. You know, he was on his ban. He had to do social work to do some training in the cliff in the afternoons, and it was must have been killing him. But he he was doing that. But I also had a, we had a problem with a kid. You know, it was, it was a shame because this lad never he never made it in the end because of his background and everything. But he was missing school. He had problems at home, so and so. I used to go and pick him up from school and bring him in. And then I saw Eric was there before the training, and I got him. So I brought brought this lad in. To, you know, for Eric to speak to him, he said he's okay if I speak to him. And I can remember it. He had his towel around him. He had that big Indian chief, you know, uh, chief head on his chest tattoo. And he'd come in and he was brilliant with the lad. He said, look, I used to be the same. Just want to do my thing running in the streets and so on. And I was something like living in a cave or something like that. I don't know what it was with the family. But he, <laughs> he, he, and he, and he said, like, you know, he give him all the right things. You know, you, you've got to love the game and you've got to come in and get your train done and so on. Um, unfortunately, it, it didn't work with that lad. But uh, yeah, he, he was great. He was he he, he, he was just a fantastic figure, wasn't he? He, he? he his football was so stylish. But that's the other thing about about we talked before about his standards of your stamp. His standards are so high in terms of his technique, in terms of his passing. But he he, he if he made a pass, it told you what to do next. So he'd, he'd just roll it so that Dennis Irwin could play it first time and cross it in. Or he he, he was a majestic footballer. He he, he 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 was Man United. He was a Man United style player. You know, the, you know for 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 well since I, ever since I know for, you've got the bounce, bunch of bouncing Busby babes. The, you know they they're here in your town. You know to see football and everybody's coming to see them. And I think that's what. Man United's always been. They might not always been the top team, but you always knew from when I was growing up, Tommy Doxy's teams were exciting teams. Then Ron Atkinson, then you, you go through. They might not always be the best team every every year, but everybody in every town, everybody away game wanted to see United. You know, you've only come to see United because they were so exciting. They had people like Cantona playing. They were it's, it's gigs, so on, whoever. They've always had that element and that's how I was brought up with football with my dad it should always be like that it should always be exciting it, it, it's to think of it more of as, as a performance than a than a military drill you know that we try to do it's it, it, it's got to be like that 
Um, and United players should be like that, entertaining the crowd. Um, and that that's what we said to the players, but also the staff, you know, you're a guardian of this history. So when you go and play in this tournament, you, you have to play like that, you know? You have to play like, like Man United. Um, yeah. Yeah, the United way. Um, thanks so much for your time today. Just one last question to, to round off. How do you feel about Eric Ten Hag now? And what are your hopes for the future with uh, uh, Amaran coming in? Just been uh, confirmed. Yeah, I'm, uh, my my hopes are, uh, are that we, tr we, we, we try to play like Man United. You know, it's the most important thing. Uh, you might lose, you know, but play but play like Man United, and that's a bit of there's a clearly been a a bit of a loss in that, and this is this is what you get if if you change from that if you change the manager too much, you know, and and now particularly the manager, it seems wherever you look, he's not just coming in to manage these players for this club, he's coming with his own style to imprint. On, on them. So Van Gaal came with his style, but it, he, he's playing three at the back with wing backs and no wingers. And, and it was slow. It wasn't exciting, you know? So, um, and he's, don't get me wrong, he's a really good coach. He's getting the things, but he's, he's like anything, he's got to fit to the context of your club and your history. And if you don't, um, then I think you're in, you're in trouble. Um, so you've, you've got to try to get it. And I just fear that the, the modern thing is we get a manager, he brings his style, he changes it, and so on. He, whereas, what style did Man United play under Sir Alex? You, you know, I think his it's, it's biggest skill was bringing the best out of the players we had, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, attack, attack, but, uh, attack, attack. That's it. That's it. It's got, it's got to be. It's got to be an attacking style of football that that's that it's exciting, yeah. But that's not. All, it's easy to say that, but if you've not quite got the players that that have picked for that, well, that's that's maybe where the recruitment has has gone from one manager to the next manager to the next. Now, if you if you have that, there's always five or six players that are going to change all the time. Whereas if you're saying, well, this is our style, and the manager's he, he, okay, he's going to bring his own influence, but but this is the way we have to play. Then I think I think yeah. you're better there. I mean, we have to stay optimistic, right? Absolutely. That that's Sorry, if you, if you're, any club, any club you're you're at, you support them, but you've got to support them through thick and thin because you, you there was a certain a bit they they'd won so much. It's not so much blase, but people don't they don't know the difference between not winning and winning. You know? Then then it it means even more. So when I grew up they were they won the odd cup. You know, they won the FA Cup now and again, and so on. And so you, you really knew the difference when they when they were winning all that stuff. You know. Mm -hmm. Um. Thanks so much for your time today. Um. I, I think uh, everybody, in terms of our listener and, and viewership, will really love it. Um. It's testament to the type of person that you are that you're taking some time out to interact with us. Um. And, I, and just from myself, Paul, and and uh, Jamie's perspectives and the rest of the team because there's a, a couple of others that work with us as well we really appreciate your time um it's uh it's really touching you know to spend a little bit of time with somebody like you for us and we really really appreciate that and also just to say to our audience that if you enjoy what we do subscribe to, uh, on spotify uh, youtube and if you want to help us out even further you can join us on buymeacoffee.com forward slash cult of cantona uh, Mr. Paul McGuinness, my best wishes to your dad. Um, Problem, thank you yeah. so much. Um, and keep being a hero. Uh, well, I don't know about that, but it's been really nice to connect today. It's good, you know, first of all, connecting with the Irish fans because it's so passionate and it, you, you it. get a great feeling every time you, you come over. But to the United fans all over the world, I've got friends in Malta who are fantastically loyal fans. They'll probably see some of this and it's, it is nice to pass on some stories that connect everybody that little bit more. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, here's to the most dysfunctional relationship in our lives continuing for a while, um, as I always say on the show. Thanks so much. Uh, my best wishes to you, and I can't wait to see what you get up to personally in the future, Paul. Cheers, no Paul. Problem. Cheers now. Thanks, Paul. See you Thank now. You, Bye. Sir.